so we are talking about uh, the necessary conditions for optimality in the constrained optimization case. Uh, I think in the previous lecture we had one specific example we were looking into. We wanted to minimize x1 plus x2 such that, can someone remind me what the constraint was? Was this the constraint? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. And so we had found out that lambda 1 star, no, lambda star was equal to plus minus square root 3 over 2, right? I, I don't have the notes with me, so somebody has to remind me what, what was there. It was one third. One third? Yeah. Okay. And I think it was just positive one third. Right, so the positive one is what we, we realize that that's the correct lambda star. And then we had some x1 star equals to, what was the expression? Uh, negative one over two lambda star. Oh, lambda star is in the denominator, yes. right? And x2 star equals to? One over six. Perfect. Okay, and then we said that in order to meet the second order necessary condition, Uh, we need lambda star to be positive number. Then it meets the second order necessary conditions for optimality. <coughs> Let's look at the sufficient condition first. What does the sufficient condition say? But before we talk about sufficient condition, I want to uh, remind you of the Lagrange multiplier. So I'll, I'll define something called a Lagrangian. This is defined as a function of x and lambda. And the Lagrange multiplier theorem basically said x star local minimum and regular implies the first derivative is zero the constraint is zero, which can also be written as and D transpose L So this was our Lagrange multiplier theorem. This is exactly what we studied in the previous lecture. <clears throat> the one thing I want you to notice is in this case, we have n plus m equations and n plus m unknowns. So the first order necessary conditions for optimality gives us n plus m equations and n plus m unknowns. Of course, in some cases, we might have situations like this, where 
lambda star could potentially take two values or multiple values. And then we need to resolve those multiple values using this particular condition, as we did in that example. <coughs> Any questions so far on this? So what is the sufficient conditions for optimality? Let x bar in Rn and lambda bar in Rm satisfy and Then x bar is a local minimum. of x equals to 0. It, the book doesn't say anything about lambda bar. So I don't know if lambda bar would be called the corresponding Lagrange multiplier or not, but it seems to be satisfying all the conditions of Lagrange multiplier. But the book is unclear on whether we can call lambda bar as the Lagrange multiplier in this case or not. So anyways, at least we know that x bar is a local minimum of the function over this manifold h of x equals to zero. Now going back to this example, if I pick lambda star equals to plus one over square root of three, it satisfies this condition, okay? So it does satisfy this condition by, by design, right? That's how we found the value of x bar and lambda bar, but it also satisfies this condition. So x bar is a strict local minimum of the function f over hx equals to zero. So that gives us the proof that the solution we found, which is lambda star equals to this, and then x1 star and x2 star computed in this fashion, actually is the, is the local minimum for that function over hx equals to zero. So that's the certificate. So this allows us to deduce x star and lambda star. This allows us to certify that that x star, lambda star, whatever we found out is indeed a optimal solution or not an optimal solution. Any questions on this? So the only important thing to note is that Lagrangian, this expression of Lagrangian, which is objective function plus uh, constraint transpose lambda, then the way we get the unknowns n plus m unknowns and n plus m equation is gradient of the Lagrangian with respect to x is zero, gradient of the Lagrangian with respect to lambda is zero. That gives us n plus m equation with n, n plus m unknowns. And then this allows us to certify that whatever we have found is optimal or not optimal. 
Okay. <coughs> Let's try to understand the steps of the proof for the Lagrange multiplier theorem. I'm not going to go into the proof in great detail. It's covered in one of the earlier courses. So you can go back to YouTube if you want. If you're interested in the complete proof, you can look at the lectures from, I don't know, 2019 or 2020, when I've covered the entire proof, but uh, it's not covered in. So after, uh, in 2022, we have updated the syllabus. So we have removed a lot of the proofs from the course. And uh, so that's why I'm not going to cover the proof, but I'll tell you what the steps are, because this lambda star is something new, something that you're seeing for the first time. And I want you to know what the origin of that lambda star is when we go through the proof. Okay, very quickly, we'll go through the main steps of the proof. <coughs> So in order to solve this problem, we uh, define what is known as a augmented Lagrangian. Let's, let's call it fk of x. This is f of x plus k over 2 norm of hx square plus alpha over 2. x minus x star square. So k is, alpha is strictly positive, and k is a natural number. And I'm going to defi define the set S as the set of x, x minus x star is less than or equal to epsilon. So we started with a problem where I want to minimize f of x such that h of x is equal to zero. Now what I'm doing is I'm going to construct another optimization problem, which is, an, which is a constrained optimization problem, but we are looking at it in a ball around x star. So now we have created a sphere around x star and I'm looking at the problem here. But in the objective function, I'm going to penalize moving away from h of x, okay, h of x equals to zero. So here is the picture I want you to have in mind. I have this function, h of x equals to zero. I have this point x star, which is on this surface, h of x equals to zero. Now I'm going to create a sphere around x star which is of radius epsilon. <coughs> and I'm going to create a function f of fk of x indexed by k, which penalizes moving away from this. If I move away from h of x, uh, let me show you what it looks like if you, if you were viewing it from here. It's going to look something like this. This is my h of x equals to zero. This is my x star, and this is my sphere. So sphere is going above and below the surface as well. It's not just on the manifold. So this is the solid sphere here, and here I'm penalizing. If I move away from h of x equals to zero, so if I pick here some point x here, then I have a penalty k over 2 h of x square, and then I also have a penalty alpha over 2 x minus x star square that I've added. Okay. Now I look at this optimization problem.
I want to solve for x in s, I want to solve this minimization of f of k x. And I get a sequence of xk. What do you think is going to happen to this sequence as k goes to infinity? The h term is going to go to zero. Yeah, this term is going to go to zero, right? Because k is going to infinity, so this term must be becoming smaller and smaller. What is fk of xk? This is less than fk of x star, which is equal to f of x star. Why should this inequality be true? Why should this be true? No, but this, why should this be true? Why should fk xk be less than fk of x star? Yes? Yeah, this term will be zero and this term will be zero, right. Yeah, so, no, this is, this is known, this is there in the book, so this is true. The question is, why is it true? <laughs> That's the definition of minimum, right? So xk is the minimum of fk of x over this entire ball. So by definition, fk of x star must have a higher value than at the minimum point. So this is the minimum point of this function. So fk of xk, this is the minimum value. It must be less than or equal to any other value within that sphere, right? Any other point within the sphere. So x star is a point in the sphere, so that inequality must be satisfied. That's just by definition of minimum. Yes? So xk is the sequence, right? And as k goes to infinity, xk should go to x star, right? Uh, yeah, that's, so it requires a proof, but the proof is very long. <laughs> So you're saying that as I let k go to infinity, this term is going to converge to f of x star? Yes. That is going to happen because xk converges to x star. Now at each iteration, as at each iteration the function is continuously minimizing, right? Right. So the function at x star is the function that you, the value that you got when the function is most optimized. Right. But which function? We are talking about two functions here. One function is fk, capital FK, and the other function is small f over hx equals to zero. Right? So this is the optimal solution when hx is equal to zero. It need not be optimal if hx could take any value in the sphere. Okay? So the result one, which comes after half an hour of labor and heartache is xk actually converges to x star. It's not obvious by the way, just so you know it's not obvious at all. I know you might feel that oh this looks pretty obvious but it's not obvious at all. It takes quite a bit of work to prove that xk converges to x star but we'll just assume that it is given to us. Okay, so what does it mean for xk to converge to x star? So x1 could be at the boundary, x2 could be at the boundary, x3 could be at the boundary. 
but eventually all this entire sequence must converge to x star and this is a solid ball so if you look at a point beyond a certain limit that point must be must be inside the open ball of this radius epsilon okay so the tail of the sequence has to be within the open ball what does that imply about the gradient of fk at xk So let's say I'm standing at this point. This is my x100. I can move in all directions, right? Because I'm inside, inside the set. So I can technically move in all directions. What does that mean about the gradient of fk of xk? If I'm standing at a point, and I know that the function is minimized at this point, and I can move in all directions. What does that imply? The gradient is zero. Right? If my d is entire Rn, if my potential feasible direction is entire Rn, and my gradient of fk xk transpose d has to be greater than or equal to zero because it's optimization over a convex set, then the gradient must be equal to zero. Right, so we should have this This is the necessary condition for optimality from uh, optimization over convex set and now my D can take all directions D can go here this way this way this way inside inside the board outside of the board because this is a solid sphere so D can take all values so this must be equal to 0 so that's result two. Now let's talk about, so now I need to know what this gradient of fk is. fk is given here, so I want someone to compute what that gradient looks like. What's the expression for the gradient? What is the expression for gradient fk xk? The first term is gradient fx. Yeah. What's the gradient of hx square? given by this plus alpha Okay, and this is equal to zero. This whole thing is equal to zero. I see. What do I know about gradient of hxk? What do I know about this? Sorry? Zero. No, gradient of this, this one will become zero eventually, but right now it may not be zero because I may be above this. I may be right here, right? So h of x is non-zero there. So this could be non-zero. This is of course a large number because k can be, k is going to go to infinity eventually. What do I know about the gradient of hxk? There is something in the assumption of Lagrange multiplier theory which talks about the gradient of h. What does regular mean? No, it's not about non-zero. It's about linear independence. Gradient of HIs are linearly independent. Okay. 
Now, now if, if the gradient of HI is linearly independent on this surface, what happens closer to the surface? Are they also going to be linearly independent? If I move, let's say I move a little bit away from the surface, I am right here. I know that along this surface, the gradient of HI are all linearly independent because I have made that assumption, the regularity assumption. Okay. Now I move a little bit away from that surface. Would the gradient still be linearly independent? It turns out that would be the case because uh, linear independence is not a, so all of these functions are continuous. So what you are doing is you have a bunch of vectors and you are perturbing the vectors a little bit. And the linear independence, if the original set of vectors are linearly independent, the perturbed vectors, as long as those perturbations are really small, will also be linearly independent. Okay? Perfect. So this is a full rank matrix. This gradient of H is a full rank matrix. What that implies is, gradient of HXK is full rank. What this implies is gradient of HXK transpose gradient of HXK is invertible. This is an M cross M matrix, by the way. It's a positive semi-definite. No, it's going to be a positive definite M cross M matrix because it is invertible. So it's not semi-definite. It's actually positive definite of dimension M cross M and it is invertible. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to multiply both sides by gradient of HXK transpose gradient of HXK inverse gradient of HXK transpose. I'm going to multiply both sides, this side and this side, by the same set of expression. What do I get? I have to give this matrix a name because I don't want to write such a long matrix. Uh, let me give this a name MK. Have we used MK yet? No, we have not used MK. So I'll give this a name MK. So I have MK gradient of FXK plus K HXK plus alpha. This should be XK, by the way. MK XK minus X star is equal to zero. I'm going to let k go to infinity. What will happen? What happens to this term? xk converges to x star. 
so this term is going to zero what happens to this term as k goes to infinity so one term is going to zero the other term is going to infinity so i don't really know what's happening to this particular term let's look at this term what is this term converging to not zero because it's a constraint optimization problem so the gradient need not be zero but this term is converging to gradient of fx star and mk is converging to whatever gradient of hx star transpose gradient of hx star inverse gradient of hx star transpose so this is converging to m infinity gradient of fx star where m infinity is basically let me call it m star so m star is basically all of this xk evaluated at x star i mean xk is replaced with x star and this side is zero so this side is zero this is going to zero this is converging to a limit so what is this supposed to converge to some vector this is a vector this is a scalar the vector is going to zero the scalar is going to infinity but because this side is converging and this side is converging this must converge to something and i am going to call it negative lambda star whatever this term is converging to i am going to call it negative lambda star and that's my lagrange multiplier well technically lagrange multiplier lambda star is minus m star gradient fx star no sorry this should be lambda star so then you have a negative sign here minus m star gradient of fx star okay so there is no negative sign here okay where do i have k h x k here i have k h x k here so this term is going to converge to lambda star this is going to converge to gradient of fx star this is going to converge to gradient of hx star so from here i get that gradient of fx star plus gradient of hx star lambda is equal to lambda star is equal to 0 <coughs> this is where lambda star appears in the expression any question so far so we started with a function we optimized it over a sphere around x star we get a sequence xk turns out xk converges to x star turns out gradient of fk xk is equal to 0 for k sufficiently large for all k greater than equal to some k bar so this is equal to 0 for all k greater than equal to k bar now for all k greater than equal to k bar i analyze this particular expression and i recognize that gradient of h is a full rank matrix as a result of which i can do some massaging by doing the massaging i get that this limit actually exists and it converges to a vector i'm going to call that vector lambda star i don't know what lambda star is but i'll just i know that it converges so i'm going to give it a name lambda star it has a very cool expression which is given by this uh, equation and then i go back to this expression and i take the limit k going to infinity and i recognize that i have already defined this limit of this term as lambda star i have already established that it converges and it has a limit and we are calling it lambda star 
So I get the first order necessary condition for optimality. I can do the same thing positive semi-definite and then I can get the second order necessary condition for optimality from this particular expression. Okay, so we are not going to go over the second uh, second order necessary condition, but basically you do ex essentially the same thing, but now with the second derivative, and you get the uh, you get the solution. What was the second order necessary condition for optimality for unconstrained optimization? Yeah, I think it was this, right? The second derivative is positive semi-definite, right? So that gives you the second order necessary condition. Okay. Any question so far? What we are going to do now is study what is known as uh, sensitivity theorem. So we know how to solve this problem, constrained optimization problem. We know how to prove that whatever we have come up with is actually an optimal solution. We have kind of figured out how to prove the result, uh, which is uh, the first order necessary condition for optimality. Now I want to give another operational meaning to lambda star. So here, how we got the lambda star, this particular vector is by taking the limit khxk goes to as k goes to infinity. I'm going to give you another meaning of lambda star in the next, uh, next theorem, which is sensitivity theorem. So x star lambda star satisfy the sufficient conditions x star is a regular point and define x u as argument f of x such that h of x is equal to u. x is in Rn. And define p u is equal to f of x u. Let me call this x star. And let me call lambda star u as the corresponding What I get is gradient of PU is equal to minus lambda star U. This is known as sensitivity theorem, this result. What is the meaning of 
Lagrange multiplier. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I am just a little lazy today. Okay, so I have this x star, I'm going to call it x star of zero because I'm setting u equals to zero. I have another curve, this is my h of x equals to u1. This is h of x equals to u2. So I can keep making different and different curves by setting different values of u1, u2 and so on. I'll get different manifolds and I'm trying to optimize the same function. The function doesn't change, the constraint doesn't change, just the value of the constraint has changed. So I get x star of u1, I get x star of u2, And based on the values here, I get f of x star of u. Okay, I get the value of f of x star of u. So I get a function p, which is purely a function of u. It's no longer a function of x star, because x star itself is a function of u. So by minimizing this function over this constraint set, I get something which is a function of u, u which appears here. And it turns out that the Lagrange multiplier is negative of the gradient of this particular function, p of u. How does that help us? What does it tell us about what is happening? So remember that this is a constraint. You have some constraint on your system and you perturb the constraint a little bit and you want to know how is the optimal value of the function going to change as a function of this perturbation. And it turns out that the, um, the value of the function that will change is exactly equal to minus of lambda star. So this would imply, let me write it here. If I look at f of x star u minus f of x star zero, what is this equal to? Or maybe like I'm just going to do the approximation. This is equal to gradient of x star u transpose u, just u. And what do I know about this? This is minus lambda star u transpose u or approximately minus lambda star transpose u. Actually, let's just make it zero. I'll just do the approximation here. So this is approximately, u is a small perturbation. Okay, so u is a small perturbation. I perturb the constraint a little bit. And then I want to know what's the updated objective function is. It turns out that the updated uh, optimal value 
is going to be connected to minus lambda star transpose u. Okay, so this gives you an idea about if you change the per, if you perturb the constraints a little bit, how much is the optimal value going to change by? And lambda star essentially tells you what the intensity of that constraint is. So if a value of lambda star, so this is equal to minus summation lambda i star u i i goes from 1 to m. So if a value of lambda star is very high, it means that you can, by making a small change in the perturbation, you can reduce the value of the function by quite a lot. Okay, So it gives you intensity of that uh, constraint, and that's why it's called sensitivity theorem. So if I perturb the constraint a little bit, how much is the optimal value going to change by? That's the sensitivity. It gives you sensi some notion of sensitivity. How sensitive is the function with respect to a specific constraint that you've imposed on the problem? Now I'll tell you a story around this theorem. So I used to teach this theorem in class. I've been teaching this class since 2015. So I've been teaching sensitivity theorem since 2015. In 2019, there was a case at, uh, at CAR where they were trying to, they had like a very complicated optimization problem for optimizing the velocity of vehicle while it's on the road. And they were facing this issue that whenever the vehicle on the side lane comes in front of me, I have to now recompute the entire optimal solution, right? Because now the the velocity constraint has changed by a small amount, by a small perturbation, because this vehicle has come in front of me. It turns out that this was a small perturbation in the constraint in the optimization problem. And by exploiting the sensitivity theorem, we were able to compute. So what was the problem with this? The problem was that every time we were computing the optimal solution, it would take us 200 milliseconds to compute it on board the vehicle. I'm saying we, but I wasn't involved in the actual implementation. It was some graduate student doing the work. Uh, so he was like, he was very irritated because 200 milliseconds was too much of a time. And they wanted to get it under 50 milliseconds. Okay, so that was the goal. And so we exploited sensitivity theorem because I knew that this is just a perturbation in the constraint. So we could use this theorem to come up with a different algorithm for optimizing it and we got it down to 40 milliseconds. So every new computation was only 40 milliseconds, took only 40 milliseconds to do. And so we wrote a paper about it and all that stuff, and then we, uh, we've implemented it on air conditioning system of the vehicle. So again, when you are driving a vehicle and you change your velocity, then the amount of power that the air conditioning system is drawing is also a small perturbation to the power draw of the vehicle. And uh, so based on that, we again applied the same algorithm and we improved the energy consumption of air conditioning vehicle of, the, of, of an electric vehicle. So now, you know, I think that particular algorithm is also in public domain. But anyways, all of this work, I mean, when I was teaching it, I didn't know where it is useful, but now I know where it is useful, okay? <laughs> so I wanted to let you know where it is useful. Many a times people see the Lagrange multipliers and they don't know what to use. What, should I throw the Lagrange multiplier? So now I have learned my lesson that I should not throw away the Lagrange multiplier because it gives me some important information about how binding the constraint is on the objective function. Okay, so that's all I have for today. Uh, in the next class, we are going to talk about uh, KKT condition, which is, uh, so now we are talking only about equality constraint, but what do you have inequality constraints as well? So we'll talk about the necessary condition and sufficient condition for optimality. And there'll be a sensitivity theorem uh, for that as well. Uh, and maybe we'll talk about it as well. And then we'll get into algorithms again. So today is Friday. Oh, next week is Monday. So Monday we'll talk about KKT conditions. Wednesday you have your midterm. Good luck for that. <laughs> so does the medium will include the uh, IRM and the KKT? No, no, no. They, they, these are not included in the midterm. Because you have only done uh, homework until the, um, until the optimization over convex set. 
So unconstrained optimization and optimization over convex set, those are the two topics for the midterm, uh, not the Lagrange multiplier theory. But the homework four will come out very soon, and that will contain Lagrange multiplier theory. So, <laughs> okay, thank you. What?